Welcome to the MSJC Internet Authoring Videocast. In this video, you'll be learning about Internet security. The objectives for Session 6.1 are Explore basic security concepts and countermeasures. Study how encryption works. Learn about phishing and digital watermarking. Understand denial of service attacks and how to prevent them. Recognize and prevent identity theft. Explore security concerns for users of social networks. We will begin with an overview of security. Security is a general term that describes any method that protects physical assets such as computers and servers and logical assets such as data from unauthorized access, use, alteration, or destruction. There are two general types of security, physical security and logical security. This visual overview will explain some of the devices that provide two types of security to different assets. Logical security is the protection of assets using non-physical means, such as requiring the use of passwords. Using logical security techniques to protect data stored on computers is sometimes called computer security. Physical security is the protection of assets using physical means, such as using locks, alarms, vaults, safes, and fireproof devices. A firewall, which might be a separate hardware device or software program, protects networks and attached network devices by preventing unauthorized communications. Firewalls are an example of logical security when used with networks. When a firewall is a physical structure that protects physical assets, the firewall provides physical security. Any act or object that endangers an asset is known as a threat. This lecture will focus on some of the common logical security threats that affect computers and data in a network. Logical security threats are generally classified into three categories. Secrecy, integrity, and necessity. Some threats can be classified into more than one category. A secrecy threat occurs when data is disclosed to an unauthorized party. An integrity threat results in unauthorized data modification and a necessity threat causes data delays which slow down the transmission of data or denials which prevent data from getting to its correct destination. As technology changes, individuals and organizations must be diligent and proactive to safeguard their assets from threats that include stolen identities, files, programs, and hard drive space, misdirected, altered, or intercepted email messages, or illegally obtained and used passwords that allow unauthorized access to protected data and services. The strategies for protecting assets from physical and logical security threats are collectively called countermeasures. A countermeasure is a physical or logical procedure that recognizes, reduces, or eliminates a threat. Depending on the value of the asset being protected, the goal of a countermeasure might be to detect, deter, or eliminate a threat. For example, you might set a password for a device to protect it from unauthorized use. To detect a threat, a computer might maintain a log of access attempts and store the IP addresses of users as a way of identifying their locations. Another example is a device that locks out a user who has attempted to log in more than three times to eliminate the threat of unauthorized use. When protecting an asset, the countermeasure that individual or organizations choose often depend on the expected types of threats to the asset and its value. For example, you might hang your jacket on a public coat rack in a restaurant with a low expectation of it being stolen. However, if you store your wallet and keys in the jacket's pocket, you might be less likely to hang it on the public coat rack. The theft would result in a much greater loss than simply losing the jacket. In this case, you're likely to keep your jacket with you at all times as a countermeasure to prevent its loss. 
The countermeasures that individuals and organizations use to protect against threats varies. The best way to safeguard against a threat is to prevent it from occurring in the first place, but that's not always possible. In some cases, individuals and organizations must implement different countermeasures to identify, contain, and control threats or to plan for losses in service or theft by purchasing insurance or installing backup systems. To implement effective countermeasures, you must do the following. Identify the risk, determine how to protect the affected asset, and calculate the cost of the resources needed to protect it. This process of risk management focuses on identifying threats and determining available and affordable countermeasures to protect assets from them. Secrecy threats are the best known of the logical security categories. This is no surprise because maintaining the secrecy of communication has been a challenge throughout history. To verify the contents of a private message, the recipient needs proof that it was not altered or intercepted during transit. The sender needs proof that the message was sent without being compromised and was delivered to the intended recipient. These standards apply to all forms of messages, including those exchanged on paper, in electronic communication, such as email messages, or by a web server. The study of ways to secure information is called cryptography. Encryption is the process of coding information using an algorithm to produce a string of characters that is unreadable. As you learned in Module 1, an algorithm is a formula or set of steps that solves a particular problem. Some algorithms use a key, which is a fact that the encryption algorithm uses as part of its formula. For example, a simple algorithm that does not use a key is list the letters backwards. For example, time written backward would be Emmet. E -M -I -T. An example of an algorithm that uses a key is if the key is X, list the letters backwards. Again, time would become Emmet. And if the key is Y, use the next letter in the alphabet. Now, time would become U, J, N, F. Using a key to process encrypted text so that it's readable is called decryption. To decrypt text, you use a key to unlock it. Without the key, the program alone cannot reveal the content of the encrypted message. Encrypted information is called ciphertext, whereas unencrypted information is called plain text. People who write programs or manipulate technologies to obtain unauthorized access to computers and networks are called crackers or hackers. There are two basic types of encryption used on networks. Private key encryption, also called symmetric encryption, and public key encryption, also called asymmetric encryption. This graphic illustrates how private key encryption works. In this example, the sender writes an email message and uses a command in the email app to encrypt the message with a private key, such as a password. When the recipient receives the email message, his or her email app uses the same private key or password to decrypt the message. During transit, the message is protected because it is encrypted. Private key encryption works well in a highly controlled environment in which the sender and the receiver both have the private key, the password in this case, or in which the sender and receiver's email apps both have the same private key installed. Public key encryption, on the other hand, uses two different keys to encrypt messages. When using public key encryption, also called asymmetric encryption, these different keys operate as a pair. A private key, also referred to as a secret key, is known only to one party, and a public key is known to everyone. Messages encrypted with a private key must be decrypted with the matching public key, and vice versa. Encryption is considered to be weak or strong based on its algorithm and the number of characters in the encryption key. The resistance of an encrypted message to attack attempts also known as the key's strength, 
depends on the size of the key used in the encryption procedure. A key size of 40 bits, called a 40-bit key, provides a minimal level of security because the average home computer can decipher or break the key relatively quickly. Longer keys provide more security because it takes so long to decipher them. This is why 128-bit and 256-bit keys are commonly called strong keys. As computers become faster and more powerful, the length of keys must be increased to prevent the computers from being used to break encrypted transmissions. As an example, a 128-bit key is a number that is 3.4 times 3 to the 1038th power, or 3.4 followed by 38 zeros. It could take a billion years to break a 128-bit key. Data integrity threats represent the second major category of logical security. Unlike secrecy threats, in which someone simply sees or steals information, integrity threats can change the actions an individual or organization takes by altering the content of a message or a transaction. An integrity attack occurs when an unauthorized party alters data during its transfer over a network or while it's stored on a device or server. For example, suppose a lawyer uses the day-to-day -day company's official website to request a transcript of a legal meeting on a certain date, but an attacker prevents the site from receiving the request and therefore prevents the company from being able to transcribe the meeting. The attacker in this case compromises the integrity of the day-to-day -day reservation data. Alternatively, an attacker could use multiple fictitious names to reserve space with the company in an attempt to prevent it from scheduling transcription services on certain dates and times with real clients. In the first case, day-to-day -day cannot fill an order that it never received. In the second case, it loses income that it would have earned if it had received orders for services from legitimate clients. In both cases, the attacker successfully diminishes the reputation and income of the company. Another type of integrity violation occurs when an email message is intercepted and its contents are changed before it's forwarded to its intended destination. In this type of integrity violation, which is called a man-in-the-middle exploit, a third party alters the contents of a message in a way that changes the message's original meaning. For the day-to-day -day company, an attacker could intercept an email message that contains a transcript of a legal meeting and change its content in a way that adversely affects a client. Integrity threats that occur when you receive an email message that appears legitimate, such as an email from your bank, but is instead from someone misrepresenting his or her identity, is known as spoofing. The spoofed identity of the sender makes it more likely that you will open the message because it appears to be real. Many people who have received spoofed email messages from banks, online subscriptions, credit card companies, and other businesses indicating that the account has been lost or must be verified in order to continue using the service, in many cases, a clue to the authenticity of these messages is the fact that the person does not have an account with the sender. If an individual does in fact have an account with the sender, he or she might read the message, click a hyperlink to go to a website that appears to be legitimate, and enter the required information into a form. The form illicitly collects the entered data, which usually includes the person's name and address, account number, login information, including a password, and often the person's social security number or a credit card number. Because the email message seems genuine and the spoof site contains the company's correct logos, many people participate in this type of attack without realizing it. Many well-known organizations, including eBay, Citibank, PayPal, and even the Internal Revenue Service, have been spoofed. Some companies become aware of the fraudulent emails when customers contact them to verify the original message. This type of attack, called phishing because it fishes for information, is difficult to prevent because it involves sending email messages that appear to be legitimate, but include links to spoofed websites instead. Simply receiving the message usually doesn't cause any harm. The recipient must follow the instructions in the message or click its included hyperlinks to actually become a victim of the attack. 
The basic structure of a phishing attack is fairly simple. The attacker sends an email message to a large number of recipients with the goal of finding recipients who have accounts at the targeted website. The email message tells the recipient that his or her account has been compromised and asks the person to log in to their account and correct the problem. Many email apps alert users when a link in an email message opens a web page that is coded to a different URL than the one displayed in the message. This image shows how to identify spoofed hyperlinks used in a phishing attack. After clicking a spoofed hyperlink, the victim opens a web page at the spoofed website and uses the page to enter his or her login name and password, which the phisher catches and then uses to access the victim's account at the real website. After using the victim's real login information to access the account, the phisher can obtain personal information, make purchases, or withdraw funds. Phishers use different methods to hide their website's true URLs, often by including code that creates pop-up windows that look exactly like a web browser's address bar. The window is programmed to open very quickly and position itself to precisely cover the browser's address bar. You can learn more about the details of phishing attacks by visiting the website for the Anti-Phishing Working Group, a not-for-profit association focused on eliminating the fraud, crime, and identity theft that would result from various types of attacks. Protecting copyrighted works from threats is a logical security issue. Although the methods used differ from those that protect other types of data, threats to copyrighted materials result from the relative ease with which existing material can be used without the owner's permission. Actual monetary damage resulting in a copyright infringement is more difficult to measure than damage from secrecy, integrity, or necessity violations, but the harm can be just as great. When material is duplicated or used without consent, the copyright's owner loses the earnings, for example, royalties or related consulting fees, from the material and no longer controls its use by others. The technology of the Internet facilitates copyright infringement in two ways. First, it's very easy to reproduce an exact copy of anything that you find on the Internet, regardless of its copyright restrictions. Second, many people are simply naive or unaware of copyright restrictions that protect electronic works. Both unwitting and willful Internet copyright violations occur every day. Although copyright laws were enacted before the creation of the Internet, the Internet itself has complicated the enforcement of copyrights by publishers. Recognizing the unauthorized reprinting of written text is relatively easy. Tracing the path of a photograph that has been used on a web page without authorization is much more difficult. Some companies that distribute copyrighted art, photographs, and other materials use digital watermarking to help protect their ownership interests. A digital watermark is a digital pattern containing copyright information that is inserted into a digital image, animation, or audio or video file, using a software program that makes the watermark invisible and undetectable. To view the digital watermark, a software program unlocks it, retrieving the information it stores. For example, a photographer might protect a photograph by adding an undetectable digital watermark that includes the photographer's name and contact information in addition to a copyright notice that is clearly visible on the photograph itself. If the photographer's image is published on a web server, the photographer can identify the image by unlocking the digital watermark stored on the unauthorized copy of the image, even when the visible copy has been electronically removed. Steganography also protects digital works. Steganography is a process that hides messages within different types of files. It is based on the fact that the digital sound, video, image, and animation file contains portions of unused data that can be used to hide messages. Steganography is generally used as a way to covertly conceal messages within different forms of communication, but it can also be used to add copyright information to different types of files. A necessity threat disrupts normal computer processing or denies processing entirely. Programs used in necessity attacks work by reducing a computer's processing speed to intolerably low levels or by completely disabling the computer. The most common necessity attack, called a denial-of-service or DOS attack, 
occurs when an attacker floods a computer, server, or network with messages. The goal is to consume the network's bandwidth resources and disable its services and communications. Even if the attack fails to disable the server, computer, or network, the resulting processing delays can render a service unusable or unattractive. Because a DOS attacker does not need to access an organization's server to attack it, websites are particularly vulnerable to these attacks. The websites for Microsoft, eBay, Amazon.com, and many other companies have been victims of DOS attacks that resulted in service interruptions to their customers. DOS attacks can threaten other types of networks, including cellular, mobile, and wireless networks. As you learned earlier in this class, a web browser loads a web page by sending a message to a web server that requests the page. The web server responds with a message that contains the HTML content of the web page, along with images and other files required to display the page in the web browser. When a web browser is used in a DOS attack, it sends thousands of page requests per minute to the web server with the goal of overloading it. In some cases, each of the page request messages has a false return address, so the web server consumes processing resources in an attempt to solve the problem. As more page requests arrive, and as the efforts to solve the problem and process the new requests accumulate, the server becomes overloaded and unavailable to process legitimate requests. Ultimately, the server shuts down. In a distributed denial of service, or DDoS attack, the attacker takes control of one or more computers without the owner's permission and uses those computers to launch a DOS attack on other computers, servers, or networks. Most DDoS attacks are launched after the attacking computers are infected with Trojan horse programs. Each Trojan horse program is coded to simultaneously open and launch a DOS attack. Other computers are hijacked by this type of Trojan horse and, without the knowledge of their owners, are used to help the DDoS attack. Such computers are often called bots or zombies. This image describes how a client can launch a DOS attack or a DDoS attack on a server. At the top of the graphic you see normal processing between the client and the server. The client sends a request to the server for the home page, the server reviews the request, and then the server sends the file named default.html to the client. The second image represents a DOS attack that floods the server with messages in an attempt to slow or disable the server. In this case, the client bombards the server with messages all sent at the same time. The messages contain false return information. The server cannot process the messages, and so the server cannot contact the client to clarify the request because the client's message contains false return information. Server processing grinds to a halt during the attack to the point where legitimate client requests cannot be processed. And the bottom image represents a DDoS attack, which hijacks clients, which are then used to send messages to the server in attempt to slow or disable the server. The master client sends a Trojan horse out to each client. Each client launches a DOS attack on the server by flooding it with messages. The server cannot process the messages, and so the server's processing speed slows or stops while attempting to process the messages. Although most DOS attacks are launched to reduce the processing power of or to disable a web server, it is possible for an individual's personal computer to become a victim of a DOS attack. Some of the first warning signs that a server or computer has been compromised in a DOS attack include the following. When a computer is affected, it might take much longer than normal to respond to user requests. Simple actions such as opening a file, downloading email messages, or displaying a particular web page might happen slowly, or the user might receive an error that the request is timed out, which means that the request could not be completed. When a server is affected, Users will encounter very slow network performance when attempting to download files, access email, or open web pages. A website might not respond at all to user requests, or it might display error messages. In most cases, the user or server will receive an exceptionally large number of email messages, all spam at once, as the intruder floods the server with requests during the attack. 
Each of these warning signs could also be the result of other computer and network problems. For example, a computer or server that is slow to respond to user requests might have a virus or be encountering other types of network problems that are unrelated to a DOS threat. If you believe that your computer is involved in a DOS attack, you should contact your network administrator or ISP immediately to alert them to any unusual activity and turn off your device. To prevent an attack on your device or a server that you manage, you must be alert for the warning signs. You can install different types of hardware and software on your devices and network that will monitor them to detect problems early and prevent attacks. A company can defend its web server from DOS and DDoS attacks by installing a denial of service DOS filter or DDoS filter to monitor communication between the web server and the router that connects it to the internet. A DOS filter, which can be a separate computer or software running on the web server, identifies potential attacks by watching for patterns in the page requests or for repeating elements in the request messages. The filter can be configured to block messages automatically if they contain similar elements and arrive in rapid sequence. In many cases, DOS attackers try to configure their messages so these filters cannot identify them, but the filter vendors respond by frequently updating their identification criteria. DOS filter functions are often included as part of a network software tool called a packet sniffer, which examines the structures of data elements that flow through a network. This image describes how a DOS filter works to prevent an attack on a server. First, the client sends a legitimate message to the server. The DOS filter receives the request, analyzes it, and sends it to the server. Then the server receives the message. Next, a client sends a message to the server that contains or is part of an attack. The DOS filter in this case analyzes the message but determines that it might contain an attack so the DOS filter prevents the message from reaching the server. The amount of personal information that websites collect about the page viewing habits, product selections, and demographic information of their visitors can pose a threat to those visitors when this information is intercepted by identity thieves. Consumers have become accustomed to entering their credit card and contact information online and an increasing amount of personal information is stored on networked computers at banks, credit card issuers, credit reporting agencies, physicians' offices, hospitals, and government agencies. As the amount of personal information stored on these computers increases, there are more opportunities for theft of that information. This image describes ways of recognizing and preventing identity theft. When email messages contain attachments with identifying data, the data could be used as credit references or identification. Blank checks can be used to steal funds from an account. Logins and passwords can be used to access accounts. Statements that include account numbers and balances might be used as credit references. Social security numbers can be used to steal a person's identity, open accounts, and secure loans. Credit cards and credit card data can be used to charge goods and services or as credit references. Bank cards can be used to steal funds from accounts. When mail is stolen from a person's mailbox, the documents might include bank statements or other identifying information. And passports can be used as identification and to steal a person's identity. Here are some steps to prevent identity theft. Keep personal and financial information in a safe place. Monitor credit card and bank statements to verify all transactions are ones you made. Be aware of card expiration dates and contact the bank or company if replacement cards don't arrive as expected. Shred your mail and personal documents that you no longer need. Never provide your social security number unless you are absolutely sure that the person asking for the information is legitimate. Put a fraud alert on your credit card report. Obtain a free copy of your credit report regularly to monitor card activity and history. Contact the authorities if you think you've been the victim of identity theft. 
As use of social networks increases, individuals and businesses must implement appropriate security strategies to protect themselves from problems and threats. Carefully control the information posted on social networking sites and use security settings that offer the most protection. Be alert to the potential security problems that shortened URLs might cause. Rely on common sense to protect identity, property, and privacy. Many hoaxes and scams start on social networking sites. In session 6.2, you'll be learning to understand security threats to browsers and how to prevent them. Investigate how to detect and remove malware. Recognize the potential security issues that arise from electronic tracking devices. Study how a firewall is used to block communications. And learn how to secure a web server. Computers and web servers are vulnerable to the types of threats you learned about in Session 6.1. Fortunately, there are countermeasures that can be implemented to protect computer assets and the data stored on them. On this screen, you see a checklist for securing web clients, securing transactions between a web client and a web server, and securing the web server itself. Each checklist provides common sense and concrete ways to enhance security. Taking a look at each individual checklist now for web clients, the checklist includes Prevent active content from running by changing the browser's web settings. Install a digital certificate. Install a program that detects and removes viruses, worms, and Trojan horses. Install a program that detects and removes malware, adware, and spyware. Block tracking devices in electronic communications and install a firewall. For browser protocols, the checklist identifies that we need to recognize and verify that our browser makes a secure connection to a web server when making financial transactions or providing confidential data. We can do this by using Secure Sockets Layer, or SSL, utilizing Transport Layer Security, or TLS, and recognizing Secure Sockets Layer Extended Validation, SSL-EV. And finally, for web servers, we have a checklist that identifies several countermeasures Installing a server certificate, using a certificate authority, authenticating users, requiring strong passwords for user accounts, and using an assurance provider. One of the most important web client security risks arises from the existence of active content. One common entry point for DOS attacks is from programs that travel with applications to a browser and are executed on the user's computer. These programs, often called active content, include Java and JavaScript programs that run on a web client. Active content components can make web pages more useful by providing interactive content, for example, calculating shipping costs, creating mortgage payment tables, or even creating animation. But they can also be used for malicious purposes. As we've mentioned, active content refers to Java and JavaScript, and also a now defunct technology referred to as ActiveX from Microsoft. A Java applet is a program written in the Java programming language that can execute and consume computer resources. A JavaScript program can pose a threat because it can run without being compiled. Although most Java and JavaScript programs are beneficial, you can protect your computer by preventing your browser from automatically running them. This will allow you to access their usefulness and legitimacy before executing them. Changing the browser settings will increase protection for your computer, but it might cause some websites that you've visited in the past to stop working properly. If you're using a classroom computer or other school computer, Check with your instructor or lab manager before changing any browser's security settings on a school computer. This screen shows the current path and JavaScript settings found in Google Chrome. First open the Google Chrome menu and click on Settings. Then on the left side of the Settings page, click Privacy and Security. Next under the Privacy and Security heading, click Site Settings. Then scroll down to the Content heading and click JavaScript. On that page, 
You can select your web browser's default behavior for sites using JavaScript and customize behaviors for specific websites that you add to the Not Allowed to Use JavaScript and Allowed to Use JavaScript sections. Malware is a term that means malicious software. It's a category that refers to software that is installed without the user's consent, usually through a hidden program in an email attachment or from a file downloaded from a website. Perhaps the biggest threat of malware is that it is designed to be invisible to the user, who might have malicious code running on a device for a long time before suspecting a problem. Viruses, Trojan horses, and worms that attack computers are all examples of malware, and the programs they run are forms of integrity threats. A virus is a program that replicates itself with the goal of infecting other computers, for a virus to spread from one computer to another, it must be executed so it can infect other files and programs. A Trojan horse is a program hidden inside another program. Trojan horse programs claim to be legitimate programs that accomplish some task when, in fact, they cause harm if the user accesses or downloads the program that they're hidden in. Trojan horse programs range from prank programs that display a message and then disappear to destructive programs that can delete or steal files. Unlike a virus, a Trojan horse does not replicate itself, nor does it affect other files or programs. Because most Trojan horse programs are hidden, it is possible to infect a computer by executing a file downloaded from a site that offers free software or by opening a file attached to an email message. When you execute the program or open the email attachment, the file secretly launches a separate Trojan horse program, which quietly does its damage. Unfortunately, antivirus software and firewalls cannot guarantee that your computer is protected from this type of attack. To protect against a Trojan horse threat, you should be careful not to execute a file that you did not request and you should only download files and programs from trusted sources. Because of the stealth nature of Trojan horse attacks, some people and companies enforce a general policy of not opening any email attachments from unknown senders. Another threat is a worm, which is a self-replicating and self-executing program that sends copies of itself to other computers over a network. Unlike viruses, a worm can replicate itself on a computer or server, but it cannot attach itself to other files. Many worms arrive as email attachments. When the user opens the attachment, the worm infects his or her computer and then quickly attempts to send itself to email addresses stored in the user's address book. Adware, which is short for ad-supported software, is a general category of software that includes advertisements to help pay for the program in which they appear. Adware, when installed with the user's consent and knowledge, provides a revenue source for software programs that are offered for free. In exchange for using the free program, a pop-up or other type of advertisement might appear on the user's computer. This category of adware is not harmful because it does not cause any security threats to the user who is informed of the ads when installing the program. In addition, the parties responsible for including ads are clearly identified in the programs. If you use legitimate adware software, the program's developer tells you that your use of it is supported by ads. The developer also provides information about how to disable the ads, usually by paying a fee to use a version of the software that does not display ads. When adware is installed on a computer without the user's knowledge and consent, either by itself or in conjunction with a program that is unintentionally installed, it becomes a form of malware called spyware. Spyware works much like adware, except that the user has no control over or knowledge of the ads and other monitoring features the ads contain. The spyware vendor does not inform the user that the software will include ads. Software that gathers personal information, tracks digital behavior, which sites the user visits or what search expressions he or she uses, or records installed software or hardware on a computer without the knowledge of the user is also a form of spyware. 
Internet security software can prevent the spread of viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and other forms of malware by blocking them from being downloaded from the server. Many companies offer different versions of Internet security software that are customized for the needs of individuals, small businesses, and large organizations. An individual or small business might be interested in installing Internet security software on several computers using a single license. A large organization might be interested in software features that allow its information technology department to update all of the company's computers automatically. All Internet security software vendors sell their products through websites, so you can learn more about the vendors and their products quite easily. Two vendors that provide a full range of products are Norton, from a company named Symantec, and Intel Security, formerly McAfee. In Module 1, you learn that some websites use cookies to store data on users' computers to provide information about their site visits, such as which pages they've viewed. Most sites that use cookies provide a privacy policy to let users know that the sites use cookies and to explain the type of data the sites store in the cookies. Although cookies themselves are not harmful, they can pose a security threat. Websites can collect a great deal of information about customers' preferences even before they place an order. The most well-known security threat of this type is a web bug. A web bug also called a web beacon, is a small hidden graphic on a web page or in an email message that's designed to work in conjunction with a cookie to obtain information and send it to a third party. The hidden graphic is usually a GIF file with a size of one pixel, which is approximately the same size as the period at the end of this sentence. Because the web bug is usually created with a GIF file, it is sometimes called a transparent GIF. It is designed to be hidden on the web page in which it appears. The GIF file shown here in the top image is on the far right. And remember, you can't see it because it's hidden. And it uses a URL for DoubleClick, a division of Google that develops tools for internet marketing and advertising. When the user loads the web page that contains this code, the browser downloads the GIF file from the DoubleClick server. DoubleClick has a network of thousands of members that provide information to it. The process of downloading the GIF file can identify your IP address, the website you last visited, and other information about your use of the site in which the GIF file has been embedded, and then record it in a cookie. The bottom image shows part of the web page that contains the web bug. The GIF file is not visible because it is transparent and therefore hidden. You would need to examine the HTML document, as shown in the bottom image, for the web page to find the web bug. The bottom image is showing a section of an HTML document that creates a web bug in a web page. Notice the cookie identification number generated for the current user. When you first access any DoubleClick member's website, it uses a cookie, sometimes called an ad serving cookie or marketing cookie, to assign you a number and record it. Then when you visit any DoubleClick member's website in the future, DoubleClick reads the cookie that it wrote on your device and it gets your identification number. As you visit different websites, DoubleClick can use its cookie to collect information about the sites that you visit and sell this information to its members so they can customize their websites with advertising that match your browser history. For example, if you've been shopping online for a new running shoe and you start seeing a lot of ads for athletic shoes in your web browser or social media feeds, a cookie is likely responsible for the apparent coincidence. Some people see this technology as an invasion of privacy because they might not want companies to know what they're shopping for. A web bug is an example of spyware because the GIF file and its actions are hidden from the user. Spyware is not illegal unless it is used as part of a criminal activity, such as gathering information to be used in identity theft. However, many people believe its use is a privacy violation or unethical. The apps you install, especially free and limited-use trial versions of apps, might include spyware to track your use of the apps and your browsing history. Or they might collect data about you and distribute it to a third party. 
You can prevent websites from writing cookies to your device by changing your browser's settings to prevent them from being stored. However, when you disable cookies, you will also lose some of the positive attributes that they can provide. By setting your internet security app or other app such as AdAware to remove cookies on a regular basis, you can eliminate the cookies that store user data on your device. Like its counterpart in the physical world, which acts as a barrier to keep a fire from spreading from one area of a building to another, the electronic version of a firewall is an app or hardware device that controls access between two networks, such as a local area network and the internet, or between the internet and a device. Firewalls can be used on both web servers and web clients. A web client firewall might be a dedicated hardware device or an app running on the computer. When a computer is connected to the internet, it receives traffic from other computers without its user even realizing it. Most of this traffic is harmless, but without protection, an unauthorized party can gain access to a computer through a port. A port on a computer is like a door. It permits traffic to leave and enter a computer. When the port is closed, traffic can't leave or enter the computer. The port might be a hardware interface, such as a port to which you connect a printer, or it might be a virtual port that handles communication between software programs. Virtual ports use numbers to isolate traffic by type. A computer has more than 65,000 virtual ports for different processes, such as accessing a web server using HTTP on port 80, or FTP traffic on port 21, SMTP or email on port 25, pop mail on port 110, and SSL on port 443. To connect a web server to the internet, you must open port 80. If port 80 is not properly protected, an unauthorized party can use it to access your computer. A firewall can control incoming traffic by rejecting it unless you have configured it to accept the traffic. For example, some websites include features that let you test the security of your computer by asking the site to run a port scan. During a port scan, one computer tests all or some of the ports of another computer to determine whether its ports are open, meaning traffic is not filtered and the port permits entry through it, closed, the port does not accept traffic, but crackers could use the port to gain entry to and analyze the computer, or stealth, the port might be open or closed, but permits no entry through it. You can run a port scan by visiting a website that offers this service. Most firewalls are installed to prevent traffic from entering the network, but firewalls can also prevent data from leaving the network. This feature is especially useful for controlling the activities of hidden programs that are designed to compromise the security of a computer. When you install a new app on your device, a firewall that provides this type of outgoing protection will notify you if the app tries to access the Internet. You can then adjust the firewall settings to allow the app to access the Internet always, only when you approve it, or never. In the past, hardware firewalls were used almost exclusively by large organizations because of the number of computers connected to the network and the expense of acquiring installing and maintaining the firewall. Most internet security apps now include firewall protection such as Kaspersky, Zone Alarm, and Norton. Most operating systems also include firewall protection because the primary function of a firewall is to block unwanted traffic from reaching the network it protects. Each organization that installs a firewall needs to determine what kind of traffic to block and what kind of traffic to permit. For example, you might configure a company's firewall to prevent unauthorized access to the network from individuals and computers outside the network, to prevent programs on the client from accessing the network to initiate data transfers, or both. Next, you will learn about security on the communication channel, that is, for information traveling on the Internet itself. In session 6.1, you learned how encryption works. Encryption is an important part of securing data that is sent over any network, including the Internet. The first step in securing a communication channel is to verify the identity of the user and the server sending messages. 
Authentication is a general term for the process of verifying the identity of a person, device, or server with a high degree of certainty. Most information systems implement user identification and authentication with login information in the form of usernames, identification, and passwords, authentication. As you learned in Module 2, many websites require you to establish a username and password before you can use the site. Some people use a program called a password manager, which stores login information in an encrypted form on their devices. Most password managers share common features such as storing logins for websites, autofilling form data, syncing data on different devices, creating strong passwords, and encryption. Some popular password managers are LastPass, Zoho Fault, Dashlane, and the Google Chrome web browser. The system that stores and manages usernames and passwords must provide security against threats. Most systems store passwords and sometimes usernames in an encrypted form to protect them. Hackers can run programs that create and enter programs from a dictionary or a list of commonly used passwords to break into a system. This is called a brute force attack. A brute force attack occurs when the hacker uses a program to enter character combinations until the system accepts a username and password, thereby gaining access to the system. Some systems will send a warning to a user or lock out a user name when someone makes a predetermined number of unsuccessful attempts to log into a system. Depending on the system to which the hacker gained access, the damage can range anywhere from reading a person's email messages to gaining access to accounts at financial institutions. Another example of a brute force attack occurs when hackers submit combinations of numbers to a website that accept credit card payments until the site accepts one. In this case, the hacker can then purchase goods and services using the credit card number that he or she has discovered and stolen. The countermeasure that protects individuals from becoming victims of brute force attacks is to use unique usernames and passwords at each website that requires a login. In addition, users should develop strong passwords that do not include identifying information about themselves, name or birth date, for example, and use a combination of non-English words, numbers, and characters. Increasing a password strength makes it more difficult for a brute force attack to obtain the password through trial attempts at guessing it. Because so many websites and other web services require users to create accounts, a server needs a way to verify a user when he or she forgets his or her login information. User authentication is the process of associating a person and his or her identification with a high level of assurance. In other words, authentication techniques give a high level of confidence that you are correctly identified when you log in. Authentication countermeasures include using biometrics such as a retinal scan or fingerprint scan, or asking one or more questions to which only the authentic user could know the correct answer to. The combination of a username plus a password is called single-factor authentication because it uses one factor. In this case, something the user knows, a username and password. Multi-factor authentication relies on more than one factor. For example, when you use your debit card to make a payment at the grocery store, the bank requires you to enter a PIN, one factor, something you know, and swipe your card through the card reader, a second factor, something you have. A third factor could be something unique to the user, for example, a physical characteristic such as a fingerprint or a retinal image. Most banks and financial institutions use multiple layers of control to authenticate users. For example, most online banking sites will require you to answer a challenge question to which you supplied the answer to when you set up your account, in addition to supplying the username and password when its web server detects that you are trying to access your account from a device that it doesn't associate with your login. Another method to authenticate an individual is to install a digital certificate in the program that is being used to send information. A digital certificate is an encrypted and password protected file that contains sufficient information to authenticate and prove a person's or organization's identity. 
using a digital certificate contains the following information. The certificate holder's name, address, and email address. A key that unlocks the digital certificate, thereby verifying the certificate's authenticity. The certificate's expiration date or validity period. Verification from a trusted third party, called a Certificate Authority, or CA, that authenticates the certificate holder's identity and issues the digital certificate. A digital signature is used to electronically sign a document using public key encryption. A digital certificate is the electronic equivalent of an identification card. For example, by looking at a person's driver's license, you can verify his or her identity by comparing the photo, height, and eye color printed on the license. There are two types of digital certificates, but they basically work in the same way and provide similar information. Digital IDs. Individuals can purchase one type called a digital ID. People use digital IDs to identify themselves to others and to websites that are set up to accept digital certificates. Most people who use digital IDs are professionals such as lawyers and accountants who use email to send encrypted, confidential data to their clients. A digital ID is an electronic file that you purchase from a certificate authority and install into a program that uses it, such as an email app or a browser. Because a digital certificate is difficult to forge or alter, an individual can use one in place of a user's name and password at some websites. The digital ID authenticates the user and protects data transferred online from being altered or stolen. Some email apps include features that send and receive digital IDs with email messages so recipients can use the digital ID to verify the sender's identity. The other type of digital certificate, a server certificate, is used on web servers. Web servers use a server certificate, sometimes called an SSL certificate, to prove their identity to external devices they connect to. This allows for transactions such as online orders. A server certificate authenticates a website so site visitors can be confident that the site is genuine. A server certificate also ensures that the transfer of data between a user's device and the server is encrypted so that it is both tamper-proof and free from being intercepted. Most browsers automatically receive and process server certificates without the user needing to do anything other than click on a link or enter a URL to make the connection to the server. An assurance provider is a third party that for a fee certifies that a person or an organization has met some criteria for conducting safe transactions and ensuring privacy before issuing the right to use the assurance provider's seal on a website. A trust seal is a verification issued by a trust seal provider that a person or an organization has met some criteria for conducting safe transactions and ensuring privacy. For a fee and after undergoing a certification process, the website can display the trust seal logo for potential customers to examine. The trust seal usually contains a hyperlink to the trust seal entity's website where the user can find information about the seal. If you have used the web to order products or to conduct financial transactions, you may have seen these seals, which are included as a way to instill consumer confidence in the security of the site's transactions. Some of the major trust seal providers are the Better Business Bureau, Trust E, and Norton Secured Seal. Each trust seal provider uses a different process to authenticate and validate organizations that use its seal. When properly used, these seals can provide some assurance that the website that you are using is legitimate. However, because the seals are easily duplicated and can be linked to spoofed sites, you shouldn't assume that a site is secure unless you can verify its authenticity. In addition to confirming the authenticity of a trust seal, your browser can also provide information about the security of a site, as you will see next. The Secure Sockets layer, or SSL, was the first widely used protocol 
for establishing secure encrypted connections between browsers and web servers on the Internet. SSL was revised several times and is still used today. In 1999, SSL version 3 was improved and reissued by the Internet Engineering Task Force. This improved protocol is called Transport Layer Security, TLS. Both SSL and TLS automatically provide a security handshake when a browser and the server to which it's connected want to participate in a secure connection. SSL and TLS both use a public key to encrypt a private key and send it from the web server to the browser. Once the browser decrypts the private key, it uses that private key to encrypt information sent back to the web server during the SSL TLS connection. Private key encryption is faster than public key encryption. When you leave the secure website, the browser terminates the SSL TLS connection and discards these temporary keys, also known as session keys. Session keys exist only during a single connection or session between a browser and a server. Most websites automatically switch to a secure state and encrypt data when it's necessary to do so, such as when the site requests login or payment information. Web pages secured by SSL or TLS have URLs that begin with HTTPS instead of HTTP. The S indicates a secure connection. Although the use of SSL and TLS increased web users' confidence when accessing online shopping and banking sites, some certificate authorities were only performing the minimum level of verification of applicants for SSL certificates before issuing them. A growing concern that fraudulent websites, including phishing sites, might have obtained SSL certificates led a group of certificate authorities to develop a stringent set of verification steps. In 2008, this development led to the establishment of stricter criteria and an assurance of more consistent application of verification procedures. Certificate authorities that followed these more extensive verification procedures were permitted to issue a more dependable type of certificate called a Secure Sockets Layer Extended Validation, or SSL-EV. Before issuing an SSL EV certificate, a certificate authority must confirm the legal existence of the organization by verifying the organization's registered legal name, registration number, registered address, physical business address, their right to use the domain name, and verify that the organization has authorized the request for an SSL-EV certificate. You can tell that you're visiting a website that has an SSL-EV certificate by looking at your browser's address bar. In Chrome, the green site information icon and the padlock icon indicate a secure connection. Notice that the URL also includes the HTTPS indicator which shows that the browser has made a secure connection to the website. That concludes this lecture. Until next time, be safe and secure. If you like this video, please click the like button and leave us a comment down below. I also would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also click the notification bell so that you'll be notified when new videos are posted.